The Red Komodo and the Zcam S6G on paper seem extremely comparable to each other. They are both shaped like cubes, both require some accessories to get to their full potential, and most importantly, they both have 6K Super 35 global shutter sensors. They are also very close in price, with them both sitting at around £5,000 plus BAT. So what are the pros and cons of each, and why should you pick one up? Let's take a look. Before getting into the differences between the two, let's take a moment to talk about why the fact that each of these cameras is using a global shutter is such a big deal. For those who don't know what a global shutter is, let's quickly go over the differences between a global and a rolling shutter. When we say global or rolling shutter, what we are referring to is the way the camera is exposing the photosites on the sensor. A global shutter is exposing the entire sensor at the exact same instance. Think of it like the sensor is either all on or all off. Whereas cameras that use a rolling shutter read the sensor a line at a time from top to bottom, almost emulating the way a mechanical shutter passes down a sensor or film plane. This means that there is a readout time of the whole sensor, which is measured in milliseconds. The faster this readout time, the closer to reading the full sensor at one instance the camera is. There are two main negative effects that can occur when using a rolling shutter, which are jello and split framing. This makes rolling shutters not ideal for fast paced action scenarios, such as when given to a fast moving operator, mounted inside or on cars, or when panning to track fast action. Ultimately in this scenario, every vertical line will become skewed. This effect can look better or worse depending on how fast the camera can read the sensor. Take the A7S III for example from Sony, which has a very fast readout time of roughly nine milliseconds. And this means that this effect is massively reduced when compared to other cameras, but not eliminated. The second effect can be seen when a light source is too fast for the entire frame to read. Take for example, the flash caused by lightning or a photography flash bulb. This is another result of the way the sensor is being read and can result in inconsistent exposure across your frame. This is where the key benefit of a global shutter comes in. Because the whole sensor is being read out at the same instance, these effects do not occur. This is why global shutters are so great for capturing scenarios where rolling shutter artifacts may occur much more effectively. However, depending on the sensor design, global shutter sensors often have a loss in sensitivity and dynamic range over rolling shutters. Anyway, let's take a look at the image quality that each of these cameras produces before getting into their sensors. For our image comparisons, we shot the Komodo in R3D and the Zcams in ProRes. Now, before you say this isn't fair, I think it is because Realistically, ProRes is the most usable format internally with the Zcams and is most likely going to be what everyone uses, and R3D is one of the key reasons to pick up a Komodo over a Zcam. It also means we can process both sets of rushes in Resolve instead of having to transcode the Zraw footage to ProRes beforehand. For this, we rigged up the Komodo, S6G and S6 all onto this Haig twin mount which worked perfectly. This way we could shoot with the cameras side by side by side. We then grabbed three 24-70 f2.8 L lenses and then clap synced them all in post so we could do a side-by-side -side of the same take across all cameras. All of the settings are pretty much the same apart from small changes in aperture to account for the different base ISOs. We used Zcam's ENDs for both of them and a Revo Ring ND filter for the Komodo. For our first set of tests, we headed down to Humbury Hill and shot for a couple of hours.
The S6G straight out of camera has a weird magenta shift, which the other two cameras do not have, but we corrected this out with our color pass and resolve. I was actually very surprised with how close the S6 matches the Komodo when it comes to color straight out of camera, but the Komodo does seem a little bit more desaturated. Let us know what image you prefer down below. As we normally do with our camera tests, we decided to conduct a range of control tests as well so we can compare the Komodo to the S6 and the S6G. We've done a bunch of these camera tests recently, so if you want to compare these tests to any of the others that we've done, you can find links to those videos down in the description below. When it comes to overexposure, we lit using false color on the Ninja 5 at the S6G's base ISO. When I refer to over or under, that is referring to the mid-grade chip, which is third from the right on the bottom row of the chart. Sam's skin is sat roughly one stop above that. We shot using the Zeiss Otis 55mm Prime across all cameras. We lit for T11 and then opened up the lens a stop at a time until we hit six stops over. We then brought the footage into Resolve and then leveled them all out to see how each camera performs. The S6G does well, holding Sam's skin up to around three stops over, but at four, you can see it starts to lose detail. Colors are held well up to five stops over with mainly yellow skewing slightly. The S6 does as well as the S6G, but I would say it handles Sam's skin a touch worse. The Komodo performs a touch better with better handling of color and Sam's skin at four stops over exposed. For underexposure, we lit for T2 and then closed down the lens, stop at a time until we hit six stops under. As we shot these tests in ZRAW, there was no in-camera noise reduction. So from around two stops under, the image is quite noisy. Some noise reduction will solve this, but otherwise you can see the image shift purple and brown as you reduce the amount of light hitting the sensor on the S6G. This is the opposite of the two other cameras, which shift to more green. Otherwise, color info and detail are held really well down into later stops. The S6 does a good job too when it comes to color rendition down into four stops. It starts getting noisier around two to three stop range with the image shifting more green. The Komodo holds color well down to minus five, but again, the image shifts green as you go through the stops, starting at around two stops under. When it comes to ISO, the Komodo doesn't strictly have a native ISO, but 800 seems to be a nice spot for the sensor. As you go up the range from here, it shifts slightly green and it gets very noisy at around 3200 ISO. However, this isn't surprising given that the Komodo doesn't feature any noise reduction. One thing you can do when shooting in R3D is turn on chroma noise reduction in the raw adjustment settings. This does a really good job at cleaning up the footage, but further noise reduction may be needed in certain scenarios. With the Z cams, we shot in ProRes for the ISO tests and had in-camera noise reduction on weak. Straight out of camera, the S6G looks good up to 3200 ISO. At 6400 ISO, you can see some detail loss and some luma noise. At 12,800, there's lots of lumen noise and not much chroma thanks to the in-camera noise reduction. The image also shifts green as you hit the higher ISOs, but color is held fairly well. The S6 performs similarly up to 6,400 ISO, but at 12,800, you can see a clear difference between the two with better performance on the S6 all around. With the S6G and the Komodo both featuring optical low pass filters, both cameras handle aliasing very well, with very minimal even at the center of our chart. The Komodo has a new Super 35 sensor, which is the first sensor from RED to feature a true global shutter. The sensor has a max resolution of 6144 by 3240, with a photosite size of 4.4 microns and a sensor size of 27.03 by 14.25 millimeters, which gives it a diagonal of 30.56. The S6G also features a Super 35 sensor, which has a resolution of 6144 by 4096, and a physical size of 23.4 by 15.67 which gives it a diagonal of 28.16 millimeters. The Komodo sensor is a nice size for a Super 35 camera, as it is a similar size to traditional 3 perf, and while the size of the S6Gs is smaller, most Super 35 lenses were built for a 31mm image circle, so you shouldn't have any issues with coverage. To see how your lenses will work with each camera, head over to our lens coverage and camera comparison tool 
link to which is in the description below. The size difference between the sensors is actually quite drastic. The Komodo has a much wider sensor than the S6G, and that means that you get a much wider field of view when using the same lens and working distance. Comparatively to the 36mm width of full frame, the S6G has a crop factor of 1.54 and the Komodo has a crop factor of 1.33. Though, if you want to achieve wider field of views with these cameras, both of them can be used with focal reducers, which we have explored in previous videos, links to which are in the description. One benefit the S6G has over the Komodo is the extra height, which could make it a better choice for shooting anamorphic. Talking about anamorphic, the Z cam features a range of anamorphic de-squeezes in camera, whereas currently the Komodo does not. However, this is again something that RED could add via a firmware update, and I wouldn't be surprised if they did. As we've explained before, RED cameras handle ISO and exposure a little differently to the other cameras on the market. Exposing correctly is important with any camera, however with RED cameras, if you want to get the most out of it, you need to understand how the exposure tools work on the camera. It does feature both false color and a histogram, which are handy to have, but these both take ISO into account. So really, you need to use either one of those exposure tools while also using the RGB traffic lights tool. This tool is great because it is using the raw image data off of the sensor, which is unaffected by what ISO you are set to or what light you have applied. When about 2% of the image pixels for a particular color channel have become clipped in the highlights or lost in the shadows, the corresponding traffic light will turn on. Both this and a histogram are on the main screen, and that's good because they are vital to use while shooting. So really this means if you are shooting in R3D, you can set your ISO at 800 and forget about it while using your aperture and shutter speed to control your exposure in camera or just changing your lighting. The Z cam also features a range of exposure tools. However, ISO is handled a little bit differently than on the Komodo. Unlike some of the other Z cam flagship cameras, the S6G only has one native ISO, which is 1250. This is quite high, so if you are shooting outside, you will definitely need some NDs. When it comes to how to expose when shooting in Zlog2, which is Zcam's log curve, Jason from Zcam did a great post on the very active Facebook group last year that covers how to get the best results. Long story short, exposing Zlog2 is similar to other log profiles, but you want to get used to using false color and waveforms to properly expose your image before getting out into real world scenarios. When it comes to the different frame rate options, the Komodo can shoot up to 40 FPS in 6K, 50 FPS in 5K, 60 FPS in 4K and up to 120 FPS in 2K. We think these will be acceptable to the crowd of pro users who are using it as a B or C cam as they likely have the budget to get a Phantom or DSMT2 on set for higher frame rates. But the independent crowd may long for some slightly improved options, which other cameras in the market like the Komodo can do. As with the rest of Res lineup, the Komodo crops in on the sensor every time you change your resolution as it's raw. So when compared to full frame, you'll have a crop factor of roughly 1.33 in 6K 1.61 in 5K, 2.01 in 4K, and 4.02 in 2K. Obviously the higher resolutions look better, but the 2K120 still looks very detailed, so as long as you aren't underexposing your shots, this can still look very, very nice. With the S6G, there is also a large range of formats. In its open gate, Cinema 6K, and 6K resolution modes, you can capture a maximum of 30 FPS across pretty much every codec, apart from ProRes HQ, which you can't record in open gate. When you stop down to lower resolutions, you cannot shoot Z raw, apart from when in HD, where you have a heavy 4.2 times crop due to it cropping in on the sensor. At 6K, 2.4 to 1, you can shoot up to 50 in every other codec. At DCI and UHD 4K, this bumps up to 56 frames per second. And again, if you window to a 2.4 to 1 4K, you can either shoot at 60 or 70, depending on the codec. In HD, you can shoot at 70 across the board, apart from when in Z raw. In the 4K modes, you can choose between cropping in on the sensor or not. When deciding whether to crop in or not, the regular worry of cameras using pixel binning or line skipping is not something you have to worry about as the Zcam series uses super sampling instead of when shooting at lower resolutions. However, if you want the extra reach, it's good to have the option to go from a 1.4 to 2.1 times crop. When it comes to color and gammas, you have several options across both cameras. The Komodo uses RED's IPP2, which is their most modern image pipeline. And the colors you can capture straight out of the camera with the Komodo really are some of the nicest at its price point. We shoot with RED cameras a lot, as we use the RED Gemini as our main B-roll and BTS camera, and we often just use the color space transform built into Premiere or Resolve to go out to 709, and then we use soft highlight roll off and medium contrast, and it looks great. The S6G features a few image profiles that you can choose from. Rec 7.9 is great if you want a quick turnaround straight out of camera image, 
Zlog2 is Zcam's log curve, which should be used if you want to capture the most dynamic range possible. It will also need to be graded in post. Flat has the same dynamic range as the Zlog2 curve, but with a Rec709 look and HLG or hybrid log camera, which is great for encoding a wide dynamic range while still looking good on standard dynamic range displays. Zlog2 can be difficult to work with at the beginning, but Zcam have a Zlog2 plugin for both Premiere and Resolve, which makes it a bit easier. The Resolve one is especially handy as we find using it as a color space transform to Alexa gives us the best and fastest results. Capturing footage is only half the battle and how you process the file is a huge part of a camera purchasing decision. The Komodo can shoot in either Red Code RAW or ProRes. The Komodo using R3D is one of the biggest advantages that the camera has over all of the other cameras at its price point. R3D is the most powerful RAW format on the market as it compresses raw mosaic data, leaving the decompression and ultimately the debayer for post. So key settings such as ISO, color space, gamma space and white balance are stored as metadata in a sidecar file and because of this can be altered non-destructively in post. You can also shoot ProRes if you want a faster turnaround in post or your production requires it. R3D is compatible with pretty much every major post-production tool, which means no matter what your workflow is, it will work. And with R3D being one of the most mature formats on the market, it means that it's one of the best performing in post. It plays back really nicely across pretty much every platform, and it is a joy to process with incredibly fully featured integration with most major programs. We primarily use Premiere Pro and Resolve, and the raw adjustments in these programs are really well fleshed out. Whether you want to get a nice looking image quick or fully color your footage, it is easy to do so with R3D. Here you can see the parameters that you can control in both Premiere and Resolve. Red also offer Red Cine X Pro, which is a free application that you can download from Red's site, link in our description, that allows you to view Red files natively on Windows or Mac systems. Cine X has been designed specifically for transcoding and pre-editorial image manipulation of R3D footage. It is also a non-destructive application, and this means that you can make image adjustments while preserving the original raw data. The Zcam E2 family can shoot ZRAW, ProRes, H.265 and H.264 internally, and output ProRes RAW via the HDMI to Atomos's Ninja 5. This is such a great range of recording formats that will fit with whatever your production requires. Zcam's RAW format, ZRAW, is not quite as well supported as R3D, and neither is ProRes RAW. Currently, ZRAW is supported in Premiere Pro and the Simulate Scratch via plugins available via Zcam's website. And ProRes RAW is supported in Final Cut and Premiere Pro. So if you're wanting to color your footage in Resolve, you'll need to transcode your footage or just shoot regular ProRes in the first place. Zcam also makes their ZRAW program, which will allow you to make RAW adjustments to RAW settings, as well as batch transcode your footage. It's nice to have this option, but exports will take a while and playback isn't great. With how many different formats you can capture with the Zcam flagship cameras, you have a range of compatibility and performance. ProRes is easily the best balance between compatibility and performance in the camera, whereas ZRAW and ProRes RAW could be good to use depending on your workflow. One thing I really wanted to see with the Zcams for a while now is the addition of B-RAW externally. It would be great to give people the option if they want to record RAW and their workflow is like ours with it being a mix of Premiere Pro and Resolve. Zcam offer a range of software around their cameras, and this consists of a Premiere Pro, Final Cut Pro, and Resolve plugin for processing color. This works well as a color space transform for when you are shooting a Zlog2. They also make a denoiser program and a transcoder program designed to transcode H.265 rushes. There's a feature called split duration in the Zcams as well that allows you to split the clip duration while recording continuously. When you drag these clips into your NLE of choice, you will notice a gap in the audio. Zcam's video concatenator has been designed to fix that. This program will take the multiple files that you have had the camera split your take into and stitch it together with no gaps. Split duration is a great way to keep your longer takes safe and prevent losing footage if you run into any issues while recording. But as you can see, this will require a little bit more time in post to fix. Both cameras have pretty comprehensive ways of controlling them, but are slightly different. The S6G features a range of ways to control the camera remotely. Zcam produces an iOS and Android app that allows you to control the camera via Wi-Fi or via the USB-C port on the back of the camera if you want the best latency possible for the image preview you can view on the app. The app is pretty decent, and if you are looking to control your camera and monitor your image on a budget, this isn't a bad option, but a proper monitor will be better. All of the flagship Zcams also feature a gigabit ethernet port, which allows you to control the camera over IP, stream directly, as well as offload remotely. 
so they can make their own software for controlling and streaming from the camera, which we have gone over in our previous video looking at the E2C. If you want to check that out, link is in the description. All of these options are awesome to have built into the camera, and it opens up the Z-Cam to some really neat shooting scenarios. If you want to learn some more about this, I've put some resources down in the description below. The Komodo also has an iOS or Android app, which can again either be controlled via Wi-Fi or with a USB-C cable. To connect via cable, you need the 420 pound Komodo link adapter. And this adapter sits on the pogo pins on the top of the Komodo and gives you a USB-C port. This also allows you to use a USB-C to ethernet adapter if you want to control the camera over ethernet. However, you cannot currently offload over ethernet. And this would be awesome if Red could add this as a future firm update. You can also connect to the Komodo over Wi-Fi, and you can do this directly using ad hoc mode, or if you want to connect your camera to an existing network, you can use infrastructure. This will then allow you to type in the camera's IP into your browser's address bar. From here, you can control every setting in the camera and the full menu system, and it's all really nicely laid out. You can also type in this after the IP address of your Komodo, which will then provide a large live preview without any controls. This is great if you just want someone on set to monitor the image without all of the rest of the data and settings that come through with the regular IP address webpage. You can find the IP address and net mask of your Komodo at the bottom of the wireless menu. The Z-Cam starts up pretty quick in comparison to the Komodo. The S6G is ready to shoot after around eight seconds, whereas the Komodo takes around 28 seconds. Both of these cameras have a compact cube design that makes them incredibly versatile. You have the ability to keep them extremely stripped down, which is great for mounting the cameras into unique and tight spaces, such as within cars or on a motorcycle. They both are roughly four inches by four inches, but the S6G is a touch longer. The S6G is also a little bit heavier, but only just. Otherwise, the physical design is pretty similar between the two. The Komodo features an RF mount, which is great for adapting lenses onto, and the S6G comes with a locking EF mount as standard, but Z-Cam offer a huge range of affordable lens mounts. You can pick up PL, MFT, E, M, or even their turbo mount, which is a 0.71 focal reducer that we looked at last year. Link to that video up here. Z-Cam also make an electronic ND cartridge that slots into either the PL or the EF mount. This has an ND range of 1.7 to 6.7 stops in third stop increments. Having an electronic ND built into the camera is a huge positive, and it's actually quite affordable. This is also a possibility with the Komodo with either the Canon RF to EF ND adapter or the Kipatai revolver. Both are a great option, but the Canon adapter cannot be locked down, so you may experience some play in the mount. With the revolver, you can lock it down using the chin strap from Kipatai, but this is a pricey option in comparison to the Z-Cam. Another big benefit with the Komodo over the Z-Cam is autofocus. The Komodo's autofocus is still kind of in beta, but it's actually really usable, which we looked at in our last Komodo video. The Z-Cam doesn't have any phase detection points, so it's a very basic contrast system. The Komodo wins out definitely on the autofocus front. The Komodo features phase detect autofocus points, so tracking is really good, and I'm really excited to see where RED takes this autofocus system, whereas the Z-Cam is just contrast-based, and it's very, very basic. It's just hit the autofocus button and hope it focuses. On the top of the Komodo, the largest and most obvious feature is the touchscreen. This is where you can navigate through the camera's menu system, as well as monitor the image, though a top-mounted monitor will be better for this. You also have a selection of buttons on the right, menu, up, down, select FN, and playback. It's great to have the option to use hardware buttons to navigate the interface in case you can't use the touchscreen. There are also quarter inch threads for mounting and then a pogo pad, which can communicate with new accessories like the new outrigger handle, but can't provide power. On the top of the Z-Cam, you have a similar feature set. However, the top screen on the Z-Cam is much, much smaller. Here you can see all the key settings you may need to see while shooting. But if you hit the FN and OK button together, you can go into an image monitoring mode. But actually using this as a monitor is pretty much only good for framing and a top mounted monitor is a must. You have the same nice large soft touch record button and five user buttons, menu, FN, up, down, and okay. You can rebind these buttons to a range of commands, but out of the box, FN is bound to change ISO, up is shutter, down is EV, and okay toggles autofocus. Zcam have written the defaults above the buttons, but I've seen many users putting gaffer tape over this to remind themselves of the custom binds that they have changed them to. The layout of the standby and recording screens is decently well thought out. You can see a lot of information that you need to see quickly while shooting. 
There's also a sensor mark for measuring focus distance and a quarter inch thread with array locating pins and a locating pin behind it too. This means you'll be able to mount a monitor bracket very easily. The back is where both cameras have most of their IO. The Komodo uses a dual Canon BP battery system and these are the old batteries from the C100 and C300 Mark I, not the BPA series used on their newer systems. One very nice thing about this system is that you can hot swap batteries, and this means you can keep the camera on for long periods of time without having to reboot, which is really nice. You then have an EXT port, 12G SDI out, and a two pin DC input. Though the Komodo does lack some IO, there are a range of breakout boxes available from RED, wooden camera, and tilter. The Z-Cam has loads of ports on the back, First off, it uses Sony's widely used MPF batteries. And one note when mounting batteries on the Z-Cam is you need to angle the battery slightly as you put them on, like this. At the top, you have a full-size HDMI 2.0 port. Next, you have the thread for a Wi-Fi antenna, which comes in the box. Beneath that, you have an Ethernet port, which you can use for control and live streaming, a USB-C port, which you can use to either record externally to an SSD or to control the camera with your phone and then a standard two pin limo for power input. This is a welcome change to the two pin half limo that was used on the E2. With this new two pin limo input, you also have a two pin limo output for powering any 12 volt accessories you have rigged onto the camera. You then have a 2.5 millimeter remote port for LAN control and a five pin mini XLR audio port. For this, you can use solutions for the original E2 or breakout boxes like the wooden camera one designed for the Alexa mini. You then have two four pin UART control ports as well. On the left, both cameras have their media slots, which on both is a single CFast 2.0 slot. The Komodo has a really nice solid door, which uses a latch to open it up. The Z-Cam on the other hand, features a plasticky rubber door, which can be a bit difficult to get open at times. The Komodo then has an exhaust vent, 3.5 mm mic in and headphone out, and a light to show if the camera is still writing to the CFast card. The Z-Cam has four custom function buttons, which you can rebind in the menu, as well as a power on slash recall button. Having these buttons here is nice when using a stripped down rig. Both cameras have different recommended media, which you can see via the links in the description below. On the right of the Komodo, you have another large vent for airflow. You then have a record button, which I think is in a bit of an odd position if you're hand holding the camera. There is also a really nice dedicated on off switch next to the Wi-Fi aerial here. So no need to be holding down a record button to power down the camera anymore as you did with the SMC2. On the right hand of the S6G, you have five quarter inch threads, three of which are in the same position as the three on the other side of the camera, then two extra ones on the right of the ports. You also have a 3.5 millimeter input and headphone out under this cover. Both cameras need some accessories to make them more usable. And because of their similar form factor, the accessories needed are quite similar. However, you do have different options available. With both cameras using smaller batteries, it doesn't mean that you can't use larger batteries. Both cameras have options for mounting V or gold mount batteries if you are wanting to use larger batteries with better power distribution. Which option is best for you will come down to how you want to rig your camera. Some honorable mentions here for the Komodo are the wooden camera sliding V-lock plate, which is great if you're wanting to use the wooden camera breakout box, and the core Swix plate if you're wanting a plate that feels like a seamless extension of the camera. Some honorable mentions for the Z-Cam are the Hawkwoods VLM-ZC2, which allow you to use either Sony's BPU type batteries, which are great if you want a smaller battery footprint, but with added DTAP options, as MPFs don't feature these, as well as the ability to mount VLOC batteries onto the back of the camera too. And the small rig Z-Bank, which extends the camera at the back for mounting VLOCs on the back of the camera. Both cameras have a large range of cage options, but the Komodo doesn't really need one for really stripped down configurations. However, depending on your rig, you may need one. One thing worth considering with the Komodo when looking at cages is what lenses you are using, as that will change what works best. With the Z-Cam, this is something that is more needed. I've put a selection down below that we offer, but what works best for you, we down to you. And if you want help building the perfect rig, drop us an email or a call via the details in the description below. Both cameras handle very nicely when combined with a nice side handle, and they both have very specific options for this. The Komodo has a bunch of them specifically designed for it, but the most popular is probably the Outrigger handle. The Outrigger is a flexible and nicely shaped side handle for the Komodo that uses the pogo pins at the top of the camera to trigger via the record button on the top of the handle. It allows you to fully adjust its angle for your preference. It also has two quarter inch threads on the top, so you can still mount what you need to on the top of the camera. 
The spacing is the same as the threads on the body, so you can use accessories like mon the monitor mounts that are designed for the Komodo. My go-to recommendation for people wanting a good side handle for the Z-Cam is the revolver clutch. This is a really nicely put together handle that can be mounted in a few different ways. But if you want a really compact setup, the Knock 1 accessory will allow you to mount the handle really close to the camera body. The handle has a nice large start-stop button and two programmable rotary clickable dials. The dials can be programmed to control aperture, shutter speed, ISO, electronic ND, audio gain, white balance and focus. It is also possible to navigate the menu without taking your hands off the handle, and you can also turn the camera on or off by holding the start-stop button. Both cameras really need top-mounted monitors, as the ones on the top of the cameras are really only good for basic composition work, as well as changing and monitoring settings. What we recommend for each camera system is slightly different though, and this is mainly because the Komodo uses an SDI output, whereas the Z-Cam uses HDMI. So while you can use any HDMI monitor with the S6G and any SDI monitor with the Komodo, some monitors allow you to control each of the cameras, and this is where our recommendations come in. The monitors that often come up for people looking at the Komodo are the Atomos Ninja 5 with the Atom X module and Shinobi SDI, Port Keys BM5 Mark II, and the Small HD Focus monitors. From what we've seen, the Small HD Focus series have been the most popular. This is because you can control the Komodo via the monitor. Their system is really nicely designed, and when you add how good the Small HD monitor looks, as well as the great interface and monitoring tools, it's easy to see why these have been so popular. When it comes to the Z-Cam, you have two solid options, and that is the Atomos Ninja 5 and the Port Keys BM5 Mark II. Both of these monitors offer camera control, but I think the Ninja 5 will make a lot more sense to most because of the ability to record ProRes RAW externally and the general reliability and design that comes with an Atomos monitor. So if you want a solid monitor that can control the camera and allow you to record externally, the Ninja 5 is definitely the way to go. With Z-Cam offering the S6 and the F6, as well as the S6G, is the S6G worth the extra for the global shutter? In terms of pricing, the S6 is £2,559, the F6 is £4,146, and the S6G is £5,627, with the Komodo being a bit more expensive at £5,940. So the S6 is less than half the price of the S6G, and the reason that the S6G is so much more expensive than the other flagship cameras from Zcam is because global shutters are so expensive. So we've explained the benefits of a global shutter and explored the differences in image quality between all of the cameras and whether or not this is really worth the extra cost to you will come down to what and how you shoot. In conclusion, the Zcam S6G is an interesting option for people wanting a similar experience to the Komodo that want a more affordable accessory ecosystem. However, the RED Komodo brings the RED experience and ecosystem to a form factor and price point that is so attractive. The only problem is the current availability of them, but hopefully this gets better throughout the year. If you're struggling to decide which camera to pick up for yourself, give us a call or an email via the details in the description below. Let us know what you think of the Zcam S6G and RED Komodo down in the comments below, and to stay up to date with our upcoming content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. And thank you so much for watching.